Okay, this is uh, Tuesday, January 25th. This is Senate Government Operations. And today we're going to be listening, we're gonna be hearing about <clears throat> the um, issue of when records become public, if they might end up in the juvenile court, which where they will become confidential. So there's some tension around that. And um, this was brought to us by the attorney general's office. And since we deal with public records, <clears throat> we'll kind of deal with the part of it and we deal with law enforcement, we'll deal with the part of it kind of up to where they enter the court system and then judiciary kind of will look at that. But before we start, I wanna say that um, <clears throat> I've had some notes lately about participation and how people are not able to participate <clears throat> and watching on YouTube is not necessarily participation. But I would say that um, we have four kind of groups of people. We have the committee and our staff and we're the ones that actually are taking the testimony and making the decisions and dealing with the bills. <clears throat> then we have people that we've asked to come in as witnesses for us. And today we have a number of those people with us. And then <clears throat> we have people who might be observers, but in the room, at, just as they would be in the, in the committee rooms if we were in the state house, but aren't necessarily participating. They're observing, but in the virtual room. And then we have that whole group out there that has the ability to watch it on YouTube. <clears throat> Whether they do or not is their choice, but they're not actually, I've had complaints that they're not actually able to participate, but <clears throat> I think the assumption is that if somebody wanted to participate in a conversation, then they would contact the chair and the committee staff person and, and be invited to come as a as a, a witness. So I just wanted to make that clear that um, I think this has opened it up to a lot more people being able to see how we do business, but not necessarily <clears throat> just participate. So the other thing I would remind people is that we um, don't use the chat function, except for Gail, who um, can use it if somebody refers to a report or something, she can use it to post the link. And I have had a suggestion that those links should be put on the committee documents for the day afterwards so that people, <clears throat> because once the chat, the session is over, the chat disappears. So Gail, if you would, once, if, if you do post um, links on the chat, if you would then put them in as part of our documents for the day's um, hearing. So any questions about any of that committee? Okay, so let's um, start. Um, we heard some testimony last week. Um, we did not hear from Sheriff Anderson <clears throat> and um, we didn't hear from Marshall Paul, but he's upstairs, oh, upstairs. He's in um, House Judiciary. <laughs> upstairs. <laughs> we'll wait for him to run down the stairs to get here. Um, but so, um, Sheriff Anderson, would you like to kind of start us off here on the how, what we heard the other day is that law enforcement has different approaches to um, giving out records. And how do we, how do we give out a record that could end up in juvenile court where it is then, or family court actually it's called now, where it is actually um, confidential if it's already been released. <clears throat> so would, do you wanna tell us about how you handle that and how, where you think we should go with this? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Mark Anderson, Wyndham County Sheriff. Uh, records requests are one of those things that are uh, incredibly, uh, incredibly technical uh, I have learned in my short time as sheriff uh, and uh, to the points I've actually since become educated on the issue that the Department of Public Safety was dealing with ironically I ran into a, a very similar uh, situation uh, the day after your last hearing 
uh, and uh, was able to apply the, some of the, the knowledge and uh, what I would consider uh, overlaps or uh, gaps uh, in our current uh, state of law. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Sherling's uh, position that uh, there's obvious issues here. Um, and I also spoke with uh, Mike Donahue uh, and understand his perspective. Uh, the, I don't know if I can forecast a way forward, uh, though I think uh, identifying ways that we, um, or, or places where uh, records are released might be a, a possible point to look at, uh, because right now uh, my public records are evaluated under uh, the public records law, as well as under the, uh, uh, when it comes to criminal violations, uh, whether in the juvenile or uh, criminal court, uh, as well as under uh, requirements set by the judiciary's administrative rules. Uh, so for example, uh, we've been instructed by our state's attorney not to uh, broadcast in press releases uh, blood alcohol content for a DUI because it could unfairly prejudice a jury. So we have about four or five different uh, documents we need to review uh, when uh, making a consideration under any public records uh, request. And the difference of all of our partner agencies, such as the Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, it could be... Um, the attorney general's office with regards to diversion documents uh, and, and a variety of other places. It's just that this is uh, a very wide open uh, hole uh, about information. I think it's appropriate that we, uh, uh, a possible a way that we deal with this is that uh, in consideration of age, uh, we could say that public records requests uh, can be uh, denied uh, for people under the age of the youthful offender statute, um, just broadly, uh, until uh, it, it's handled through a process. We could have an administrative process that could review these. Uh, I'd ask that it would not be a burden, uh, a cost shared by an agency that holds the records, um, but potentially like a magistrate could make an evaluation on what should or should not be released in a certain time frame. But I don't have the answer, Madam Chair. So could you... <clears throat> just deny all requests for anybody under whatever the age is. I mean, it, it's an increasing age now. We understand that, but so, but could you just deny them on that basis? And then if it ends up going to criminal court, then it's a public um, <clears throat> document anyway. And at that point you could release. And if it goes to family, then it's just not releasable. Right. Certainly that's one avenue, uh, not to say uh, uh, maybe even an extension of the time frame for which uh, we submit a public record or have to respond to a public records request. For example, uh, most court processes are gonna occur within six weeks. Uh, there's times where that could be extended, but generally speaking, uh, let's say it's gonna be eight weeks. Uh, if I have the opportunity to delay my response from the, the typical uh, three days, three business days, to say three months, then that would give me the ability to follow up with, uh, with a requester of public records uh, if I have question as to whether something should or should not be because they're gonna be potentially be going into a youthful offender program or diversion. You couldn't just deny it. We could deny it, but the recourse of the, re uh, the requester would be to file suit in the civil court and whoever loses that suit is responsible for the, uh, the attorney's fees. Uh, so I could potentially under current establishment of public records law, I could be responsible to pay thousands of dollars of fees simply because I'm trying to protect the identity of a juvenile. Yeah, I was thinking of <clears throat> if we actually changed the law so that law enforcement didn't release until it went, until the determination of whether it went to criminal or family, um, then you would be in compliance with the law. So there wouldn't be, anyway. Brian, did you have a? I do, Senator Colomore, I mean. Thank you. Um, I, and it's kind of off topic, but when you mentioned <laughs> it, Sheriff, I, I kind of went, oh, I didn't realize that. So is it just the policy of your department not to re, um, to release the results of the uh, BAC, or is that a statewide policy? 
Uh, so uh, I'll say it's a policy of my department in action, not necessarily in writing. Uh, we've just instructed deputies not to do that. Uh, that okay. was recommended by the Wyndham County State's Attorney. Uh, my understanding is that uh, many state's attorneys agree with the, uh, the reading of the administrative rules uh, from the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, so I would not be surprised if that were broadly applied. I can't speak for other agencies, though. Because I have uh, seen <laughs> on printed reports where someone's blood alcohol content will be disclosed. And I, I liken it, although I realize it's, it's not exactly the same as someone's um, speed. In other words, if someone's on the interstate and they're going 96 miles an hour and that's released in a press release, does that also not influence um, a jury later on to say, well, geez, the guy was going 96, he must be guilty. I, I think it's a, uh, my opinion is it's a strict uh, reading of the administrative rules by the state's attorney's office and their obligation is to notify agencies um, of things that could potentially prejudice. And I think the key word is potentially. Uh, so while we've agreed uh, not to release the information at our, our state's attorney's request, um, I've also asked her what happens if we do. And her response to me was, well, you, that, that's your prerogative. Um, so, so do you release the speed that, at which a vehicle was traveling? I'd have to get back to you on that, Senator. Okay. Just so, Senator Colm, or perhaps Jay Pepper could just answer that one question right now about sure. whether other states' attorneys do that. So, um, for the record, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. So, I am the uh, public records officer for the entire department, <coughs> all 14 states' attorneys. And um, there, so you're dealing with somewhat conflicting areas of the law. Um, the, right, the exemption for, and I, and I should just say, the exemption for adult court is that we will not release records that could potentially interfere with enforcement proceedings, including the prosecution. And that's based on um, 1 VSA 317-5A uh, sub 1. However, there is um, an exemption to the exemption, um, which says that all records related to the initial arrest shall be public. So there is some con conflict there. Um, and that's where um, the state's attorneys, when they file charges, certainly aren't going to release records that might prejudice a jury or might spoil a case and have to get it transferred to a different venue. Um, but all records related to the initial uh, arrest are public, and that's more of a law enforcement question. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit of play in the joints there as to what records actually have to be released and which ones will, will could uh, interfere with enforcement proceedings. And it's really kind of a case by case uh, analysis, but I, we try through our department to add some consistency to the 14 offices by having all records requests run through the department through the public records office. Okay, thank you. Thank, <clears throat> thanks. So <clears throat> I, I believe that what we're dealing with here is the law enforcement part of it. Um, so <clears throat> I don't, where are we? Um, uh, if ever, do you have any more words of wisdom for us? Well, it's it's the law enforcement aspect of this when a criminal case or, or I mean a juvenile case is probable. And that's mm -hmm. the problem is that, you know, you don't know how long an investigation might take. You don't know how long, uh, whether the state's attorney is going to refer to diversion, which would then in initiate a confidential process. And so... Right, Sheriff Anderson is right that there is this potential gap here, and there's a number of ways to to fix the problem. And or I, I, it's not even fixing the problem; it's offering more clarity to the people, the mm -hmm. custodians of these records, when they get these requests. <clears throat> and um, you know, Sheriff Anderson threw out a few possible examples um, of ways to exempt this. I think it's important to remember, though, that the facts of the case could in interfere with the proceedings, true. Um, 
But what I think is most important to remain confidential for juveniles in particular is not necessarily every detail of the case, but um, the name of the individual mm -hmm. and, and the information that could interfere with the law enforcement proceedings. But some basic information about the case could be released, you know, for the <coughs> case that, uh, you know, led to the letter from the attorney general's office to this committee. You know, there was some information about the crash that could have been easily released. It's when you start releasing the names of the individuals that you start seeing these collateral consequences and long-term consequences of that information. So I, I don't have a solution for you, but I, I think that there are ways to proceed that would address, that would alleviate some of the media's concern about knowing what's going on in Vermont. Um, and being able to report on that, but also then protecting uh, youth from these long-term implications of, of being involved in these incidents. Committee, do you have any, I, I guess I um, am looking at this <clears throat> very simplistically, and it seems to me that an, a solution is just to, in the public to make an exemption for all, um, and arrest records for anybody who is under a certain age that the name and certain information be exempt from public records. And <clears throat> once it, and I don't know if you have to put in a, a qualifier there that unless it goes to criminal court, but it certainly when when there's a question of whether it might go to diversion or family court, that why wouldn't we just make that an exemption to the public records law? Uh, Anthony, Senator Polina. I, I, I agree with what you said. I, I was so I was going to say, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Because people are saying, well, we don't they don't have a solution. It does seem kind of simple that we would simply say that, you know, keep it out of the public record until such time as it goes to criminal court. I mean, it Senator sounds, Clark. I don't know, it seems like, I would guess that, I, I understand why the media and others want this information, but I think as a community, we have a shared desire to shield kids from damaging information that may not prove to be, they, they, may, they may not prove to be guilty. Um. Uh, Senator Clarkson and then Senator Colmore, but didn't Commissioner Sherling say the other day that many law enforcement just say um, juvenile name withheld and, and, and then don't release a lot of um, what the information is that could be potentially damaging? But anyway, Senator Clarkson. And then Senator uh, uh, I, I, I would agree with you. I don't, I, I, I'm not sure that there is a problem bigger than you've identified. I mean, I think it should be uh, uh, not, not shared until there's action that uh, requires it to be shared. It, it, you know, to, to be a public record, I think it needs to be protected until uh, the, a point where it doesn't need to be protected or where it's required not to be protected. Senator Colomore. I'm trying to recall, Madam Chair, whether there was a carve out for the 10 big crimes or not. There. Um, I think there was, but I'm not positive. And yeah, I the guess 12. I... <coughs> you mean a, a carve out about them going to fan, juvenile or criminal court or in terms no, of release, the record? Releasing the name and the uh, age of the uh, alleged <laughs> perpetrator, I guess you'd have to say at this point, if someone was a, I don't know, pick a crime, or uh, accused Arson. of, you know, five murders. I thought we said that there was a list of 10 and that those would always be released, but it was the other ones that we were more concerned with, uh, perhaps staining somebody's reputation later on. But I could be. Um, I, could be no, I, I seem to. I seem to recall that as well. I don't remember the list, but there's a list of ten or twelve things. Yeah. Right. Well, there are the there are the big ten, big twelve. But yeah, well, Pepper, I would Pepper be, sent them to us. Yes, and I would be I would be somewhat concerned about carving those out in terms of the juvenile, just because there are some of them that are 
Um, for example, lewd and lascivious with a child could be two youngsters. I mean, two two kids within a certain age span, and that's lewd and lascivious. And do we really want to? Um, and then the definition of lewd is so bad that it says to be lewd. So, um, I mean, I, I would be I would be concerned about carving those out until it's decided if if they're really horrendous crimes, they're probably going to go to criminal court. If there are extenuating circumstances, they might go to family court. What do you, Pepper? Um, well, er everyone is correct uh, that youth between the age of 14 and 22 that commit the big 12, criminal court has original jurisdiction. So they're filed in criminal court. So they are public. Um, okay. And so I don't think you need to do a special carve out for that because that's under the jurisdiction jurisdiction statutes of the juvenile court. Um, they they explain the kind of various uh, ways that cases get cited or who has jurisdiction. Um, but really, I think you know this comes down the question that really I think the committee needs to struggle with is um, what if there's a delay between the incident and the charging decision and what happens during that delay you know it could be months where law enforcement is investigating what's going on and there's intense public interest in an incident um and you know how much of the record uh should be disclosed at that point prior to charges being filed or delinquency petitions being filed in family court so uh, senator colomer yeah, and I think uh, James is, is spot on there. Um, I guess what I'm wondering about, Madam Chair, when you say well, we wouldn't release, are we talking about just the name or the age or the town in which this person resides? And in other words, we have to decide how much of the information should be withheld and how much should be made public. And of course, the other thing is, and I realize that this committee will have absolutely no, no way to prevent this, but on social media within, oh, let's yeah. be honest, within 24 hours, everybody knows, who's, everybody knows who it is anyway. Yeah, you're right about that. So Sheriff Anderson, did you? Yes, thank you. Uh, Senator Collimore, just to follow up, I looked at a couple of our past press releases and we do indicate the speed. So there's, there's discrepancy uh, in terms of uh, what numbers we do and do not report, uh, but I have not been given any instruction not to report speeds, so we've continued with that practice. Uh, to the point, um, I, I do want to uh, encourage the committee not to look at this as a law enforcement specific issue. While we are certainly in the limelight uh, in most of these things, especially an investigation of significant community interest, uh, part of uh, Part of the concern I have with this is what role does the Judicial Bureau play in this? What role does the Department of Motor Vehicles play in this? Yeah. Um, and I can say, okay, well, I do not have a, a public record to this, but they could say, well, here's all the information anyways. Uh, <clears throat> we know that the, the person who got the ticket for driving over the center line uh, based on law enforcement's press release that says a juvenile's name withheld, uh, we know that that ticket was issued well, the Judicial Bureau could release that information as well, which then just ties everything back together when we are trying to shield youth from, from uh, having this history hang over them. But um, Pepper and Chris Herrick, correct me if I'm wrong here, and Tucker, but if we made an exemption, if, if we made that the public, the record involving a juvenile, with the name so that the only thing that would be released would be the nature of the crime or whatever it was and juvenile name withheld. If we made an exemption, wouldn't that also apply to the traffic bureau? I mean, they wouldn't, if, if it's exempt, it's exempt, right? Tucker, is that right? If you were to amend 1 VSA section 317C5 to make it so that the initial records related to the arrest of a person and the charges 
were exempt when they related to a juvenile, that would be applicable to all public agencies in the state. Right. Is that, is that your understanding, Pepper and Commissioner? Uh, yes, I mean, we're all reading from the same statutes, yeah. My only question, and good to see you all again. Thank you, good to see you. For the record, I'm Deputy Commissioner uh, Christopher Herrick from the Department of Public Safety. Um, would that, and it would be up to you, would we also be talking about non-criminal records um, such as crash reports? I, I would think that anything that could end up going to juvenile um, or family court would be, whether it's um, civil or criminal, but that's a decision we have to make and hear from people. Um, and I know Pat Gable is with us, but, and Pat, I think that the courts have their own um, rules around confidentiality and the release of records. So uh, we don't wanna get into that necessarily, just because I, I know that uh, judiciary is going to be looking at this also. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, in our uh, public access to court records rules, we include um, as exempt from uh, being accessible, uh, any categories that the legislature identifies. And so the way our rules are different is our rules are different from the Title I uh, public records law. But if you put in substantive law that certain information is confidential, then we incorporate that into our rules. And so I think if you wanted to in, uh, include, for example, if you're worried about the Judicial Bureau, which is not a criminal um, court, uh, but you wanted juveniles' names to nonetheless be withheld, then you could adopt a substantive statute about that, and then our rules would incorporate that, and then uh, we would, under our rules, we would then uh, keep that confidential. Okay. What we like to do is we really like to understand the public policy I think I might have testified to this before. We're following what the legislature does and trying to have our rules be consistent with the public policies that the legislature follows. There are certain procedural aspects of our rules that um, are unique. But if you identify that uh, the names of juveniles as a matter of public policy should be uh, confidential and not subject to a public access uh, request, then uh, we will follow that. Senator Gallimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not that this is either necessarily the answer or an aid to get to the answer, but how is Vermont stacking up versus other states in this regard? Does anyone know? If I got pulled over and I was 16 years old in Massachusetts uh, after killing somebody in an accident, would my name get reported? If I was in Shame Texas, you. would it get reported? Shame on you. I, I know this question came up last time. I mean, I don't know what other states are doing, so I can't answer you directly, but I can tell you that the the problem that we're trying to solve is an interplay between two state statutes that we have, you know, the uh, 5119 in the juvenile statutes and the 317 in the public record statutes. So it is in our public record law is modeled on the federal law, the federal FOIA law. So, I mean, it's kind of a unique situation. So I don't know what other states are doing, but I can tell you that the problem that was originally raised about what to do with these records, um, you know, is, is a creation of the interplay between two of our state statutes that might not be you know, similar to other states. Okay, thank you. Tucker? 
Uh, the last time that you all got together to discuss this, I did write down that you were curious about what is happening in other states, and I started to do research into that. Uh, Vermont is among the seven most protective states in the country. Uh, however, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison for the reasons uh, that uh, the state's attorney just pointed to. Uh, the Public Records Act in Vermont doesn't deal with custodianship directly. And in a lot of these other states, uh, the custodian of records who is responsible for responding to a request um, may be designated under an individual statute. So in these other states that are equally as protective as Vermont, you may have, for example, the court being the central custodian or repository for the records that you're concerned with. The issue that is before you is that you have two separate potential custodians of records that have to abide by two separate statutes. And that is where the tension is coming up. So as you're considering your solutions moving forward, you've already brought up potentially exempting under the generally applicable statute, uh, the initial arrest records. You may also want to point to who is going to be the custodian of the records as they go to proceedings. And that would alleviate the burden on the arresting and charging agency. They would be able to apply the exemption and say, we don't release records that apply to this age group or to you know, these details about individuals who are arrested in this age group. And then custody of those records would transfer to another public agency, potentially the courts, where the determination is made as to where the case will be brought and then there is a clear path for access to the records. And in, in the um, Vermont uh, public access to court records rules, we do identify uh, custodians of records that are in the court's uh, possession. And uh, as we get to digital records, they're mostly me, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? What Tucker said is to, to um, exempt if you exempt the initial arrest except for uh, i guess the i don't know how much you would um release um does it make sense then to transfer that custodianship to the courts so so the courts once something comes into the court in any way um we become custodians of those right. records in terms of the court files and so my question for Tucker would be, do you mean, for example, if someone wanted to request access to the record that rather going to law enforcement, for example, they would come to the court? Is that what your suggestion is? Yes, my suggestion is to state clearly that the court in this case would be the official custodian of those records. So if a law enforcement agency had the initial arrest and charging records, it would be transferred to the court and the courts would determine what to do with them from that point on. And really the statute would just be alleviating the burden on uh, the public agencies that are subject to the Public Records Act because the statute could expressly state that they are not the custodians of these records. Uh, Senator Rahm and then Senator Clarkson. I'm just wondering if that creates like a right of action or culpability. Let's say the family was really upset that another agency released the name or information. Are they then able to sue that agency because they released the records when they shouldn't have? I'm just curious what it means to be a custodian versus to unlawfully now or just against protocol release the records if, if one actor did that. Tucker? I do recall that there is a either a right of action or a penalty associated with the unauthorized release of confidential information. And I wish that I could recall offhand what that statute is <laughs> so that we could pull it up. Um, but this discussion came up in some of the research that was done by the Public Records Study Committee back in the day. And you'll notice that it is inconsistent in the exemptions uh, because many of them were adopted prior to that study, but many exemptions are now tagged with the duty 
clause shall keep confidential to make it clear that the public agency has no choice and they are bound by confidentiality. And it likely points back to the statute related to um, the unauthorized release of confidential information which might even apply to the individual officer who releases the information. But again, I can't recall offhand. Senator Clarkson. So uh, I, I sort of like the, the I mean, the, the two custodians at the moment are the courts and the, and the uh, Office of Public Records. Who, who are the, because we have a whole chain of custody. I mean, the chain of custody be, and, and it can't get immediately to the court. So you have a chain of custody with the officer and then the, the department and then the who then you get it to the courts, but that takes, you know, maybe hours or days. So there's a chain of custody all along the way until it resides in its final place of custody, right? I mean, it's, so you have to have, have rules for the whole chain. Well, well, well or not. I, might, I might have misunderstood Tucker, but I thought that he was saying that if you, if we choose to exempt um, from public record requests, right. um, the initial arrest record of a, a juvenile, that it would then immediately become lodged with the court. court. That they would, they would then become the custodian because they're the ones that are gonna decide whether it goes to juvenile or criminal. It, right. it, did I misunderstand that? So that there is, it would immediately become, so Mark arrests somebody tonight and the paper calls him and says, who was that? He says um, that the court is now the custodian because it was a, a juvenile. Is that, am well, I making I understood it simple? It. I understood it differently, which is that okay. if you decide that's not a, a public record, then if someone calls the arresting officer and says, what's this person's name? But the arresting officer would cite the statute that says that's confidential okay. and that um, it doesn't come into the court until the prosecutor, for example, files okay. it. And at that point, it is a record that becomes part of our system. And um, once we're all digital, I would become the custodian of that. And so then the reporter would call me up. I'm interested in the record. And then we would look and say, oh, we can't release that uh, particular record because it's exempt uh, under you know, the, the law because you identified that as a, as a confidential record. So I think in Tucker, and correct me because this is his idea, but I think what happens is until it gets into court, it's really not accessible by law. So the arresting officer no longer has a responsibility to disclose it because there right now maybe there is a responsibility of some kind. And so that means that um, uh, in the so-called chain of custody that you're talking about, uh, anybody along the way can just cite the the statute because it doesn't really become effective until it becomes a part of a court proceeding. So I don't know, Tucker, is that the way it works in other states? I'm not familiar with that law. That is yeah. the way it would work out yeah. in what I proposed as an option for the committee to consider. It would be exempt while it is in the custody of the public agency that's subject to the Public Records Act mm -hmm. until the point that the court proceedings begin and then the statute dealing with those court proceedings would say that the court becomes the custodian of those records. So just to play this out, if you are the arresting agency, the arrest is made, you have your records, a request comes in at that point, you respond and cite the exemption. And you would continue to be responsible to respond and cite the exemptions up until the point that the proceedings begin and the court takes possession of the records. At that point, if a request continues to come in to the arresting agency, their response would be that they are not the custodian of the records and that the request should be submitted to the courts. Oh, yeah, I get it now. 
Uh, Mark, Sheriff Anderson. Uh, Tucker, thank you for that explanation. I think that clarified a lot for me. Uh, I, thinking of that solution uh, with a, a potential edge case scenario, uh, let's say that I have a group of uh, teenage children who uh, partake in something that's of questionable uh, legality, and we uh, are not sure if uh, we're not sure if charges can stand. We send it for review to our state's attorney's office, and ultimately we're notified that they're not going to press charges. Would that notification then indicate that? Uh, the the exemption no longer exists? The exemption would continue to apply while it is in your possession. The piece about custody would not come into play if it's not referred to the courts. Great. Just want to clarify a little bit. Um, the way it works now and would work then, Tucker can correct me if I'm wrong, if we have the record and there's a request, we have to acknowledge the record, but we're citing the exemption and not releasing it, but we still have to have um, collected it. And if there is an appeal and a, a suit, it goes to a judge. So the record still needs to be produced um, in that case, uh, but we would cite the exemption. We, we currently do that now for a number of cases. Is that right, Tucker? That sounded right, but I was having audio problems. Okay. So, <laughs> but, but I think I, because I think, Chris, Commissioner, if I am um, not wrong here, I, I think currently um, it, there's less likely for a suit if the lang if the statute is clear that um, one of the reasons we have the suits, I believe, is because of unclear language and, and also unclear intent of what the intent of the legislature was. And in this case, I think the intent is to protect those um, people whose lives could be irreparably damaged by just having something come out. And that isn't to say that there are victims, if there were victims, lives that haven't been damaged, but if it goes to criminal court, that will come out anyway, so. I can't speak to the motives of why somebody um, files a lawsuit challenging right. an exemption, but I will say that it's probably the case that with any new legislation, there will be um, some challenge to it to, mm -hmm to see what the uh, the, guard, the guard rails are on it. I, you're right, I'm sure. Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just trying to understand what the commissioner said. I think I got it, but I just want to <laughs> double check. Um, so something happens that rises to the level of an arrest, whatever that may be. The facts of the case are that such and such a thing happened on such and such a date at such and such a place at a certain time, but you would not necessarily go beyond those facts when you issued a press release if we continue along. And so it would just be that a juvenile, and I still kind of want to get Madam Chair to the part where are we, are we mentioning age? Because that doesn't necessarily identify anybody. Does, do we mention where it happened, because that doesn't necessarily identify anyone. So in other words, it could say a 16 year old from Braintree was involved in a fatal accident and the rest of the facts, as Commissioner Herrick mentioned, are still in, in place. It happened at such and such a time on this road and here's the result of it. Is that what I'm understanding? I, I in my um, world, we wouldn't say a 16 year old from Braintree. We would say there was an, a fatal accident on Route 23 at four o'clock on Wednesday, um, a unidentified juvenile was involved. Let's just right. say for, for argument's sake that the police report stated that 
um, so and so and so and so. The parents were called to the scene for whatever reason. That information would also, in this circumstance, uh, be exempt because it would point to identification. Right. I. I yes, yeah, Senator Clarkson. Uh, yeah, I think anything that identifies a juvenile or their parents is would be protected. Well, you know, Senator Colomar is right that within half an hour of it happening, that the neighbors will have it on their um, Facebook. No, and it'll no, not necessarily. I but mean, in it, lots of cases, in lots of cases, believe me, it, yeah, but, we, but, but that's, we can't control that. What we can control is our public agencies and yeah. how we, how they respond to protecting um, juveniles. That's yeah. all we can control. Right. I, I guess, yeah, I guess my point, Madam Chair, was if you take Chittenden County as an example, there's thousands of 16 year olds from Chittenden County. I don't think by disclosing someone's age, you've necessarily made it I, an identifiable sort of fact. Uh, I mean, you could just say, for that matter, you could just say an unidentified juvenile from somewhere in Vermont. Uh, you right. know what I'm right. saying? I, I, I don't understand why, why there's reluctance to at least mention an age. Um, in Chittenden County, that might be true. If you're talking about um, um, Wynn Hall, there aren't very many 16 year olds. And so if you said a 16 year old from Wynn Hall, it, it probably um, people would start guessing um, who it was. If you said an unidentified juvenile and didn't right. say where they were from. So a juvenile- or just, or just a juvenile. Yeah, well, I think you, you say an unidentified juvenile. Well, but the juvenile is identified to, to the police. It's just, it's, it's unidentified to the public. Yes. But it, it, so it just, it, you can just say a juvenile. Um, yeah. But I think a juvenile who's 16 in Reading, it could be the only 16 year old in Reading. Yeah. Okay. I understand. Yeah, I think that that's, that's why when you have, it's like if you have, um, when you have hospital reports of, um, what do you call those? unanticipated incidents, that's not what you call them, that the, um, the wrong leg is removed. Oh, right. Um, every, it has to be aggregate um, reporting because everybody knows who that happened to. So it has to be aggregated. So, so what, um, what if we wrote, what if we designed such a, a Potent, a draft of a potential bill and um, and then asked for people to comment on it. If we could, then we would have some language for people to respond to. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So An what do we want Anthony, in there? Anthony has a Oh, Anthony, I'm well, sorry. It's, it's, I it's just, I was, I want to be clear. I mean, I think what we, what you just said is fine, but what's the role of the Judiciary Committee in this? I thought, I didn't know whether we were writing a bill or a Judiciary is writing a bill. I'm just curious what that, what's happening there. Well, we may not, the Judiciary may not, um, since we're looking only at the, the pre-court. Right. Um, they, they're, well, we're looking at pre-court. So we're looking at um, uh, the Judicial Bureau or the Traffic Bureau and um, DMV and law enforcement. The Judiciary Committee may may or may not do uh, look at this. I think that when um, Pat Gable was testifying before, she had some other issues. And I think the commissioner did also around just public records and the court system in general, and that we needed to have some Further conversation about that, but that does isn't necessarily um, mean that we shouldn't go forward with this. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Uh, uh, yes. It's fine. 
And I just have a quick question for Tucker. Tucker? Yep. The courts that are the same are subject to the um, open, the uh, Information Act, just like the other agencies are? They're not subject to the open records. No, and I think that Pat has given a wonderfully concise uh, explanation as to why, but the, uh, the court has constitutional authority to adopt its own rules relating to the administration of its records, and it has exercised that authority in adopting the access to uh, court records rules. Uh, That's Pat, what I, thought I don't you know said. if you want to expand on that. Yes, and uh, I think I might have mentioned it last time, which is that um, from a constitutional point of view, the Supreme Court has that authority. And what the rules do is divide the records up between administrative records and case records. And the, in the administrative records section of our rules, we essentially adopt by reference uh, the public records rules in Title I, with some exceptions. But in general, uh, because administrative records in the judiciary are not terribly different from administrative records anywhere else. So even though it's a constitutional authority, again, we're uh, trying to follow the public policy that's set by the legislature for the state. Then there are case records. In that, we are completely unique. And, um, and therefore, the case records are adopted by the court, often in reference to, um, you know, in reference to other states, how are they handling case records? And in our rules regarding case records, we have a reference back to statutes adopted by the legislature that uh, specifically identify information that should be confidential. And so we have references like that both in, I think it's rule five and rule six, and one of my jobs under the new rules is every year I have to do an inventory of the changes that the legislature makes and what is and isn't confidential. Uh, so, and I, I would just add um, the Judicial Bureau is a part of the judiciary and therefore the court access to court records rules also apply to records in the uh, Judicial Bureau. Oh. I see um, Marshall has joined us. Marshall, I don't, did you just join us? Uh, um, yes, Senator, I just joined you. I'm sorry for the delay. No, 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 no that's the House Judiciary. We understand you were upstairs. So, uh -huh. um, so what we've been talking about here, committee, I'm gonna just um, try and uh, bring Marshall up to speed here and then he can comment on where he think what we're thinking about. We are um, consider we're going to have Tucker do up a draft of what could be a bill or could be part of another bill um, that would make any uh, initial arrest record um, of a juvenile um, exempt from public records request. And then, um, and then it would also, as soon as there was a, as soon as the record or the charge or whatever got to the court system, then the court would become the custodian of the record. So if uh, Sheriff Anderson arrests somebody, he is under the obligation to keep it confidential. And then once it goes to court and he is continually pestered about uh, releasing the record, then he says, I'm no longer the custodian, you have to go to the courts. That's what we're considering. So I can jump in right at that point and say, to me, that sounds very consistent with, um, you know, our sort of a consistent implementation, a procedural implementation of our existing law on the confidentiality of juvenile records. Um, I, to me, listening to the first day of testimony, um, and I apologize that I was not able to listen to the testimony earlier today, but listening to that first day of testimony about this issue, it struck me that the issue was probably not with the juvenile confidentiality laws, so much as coming up with a procedure to make them, to implement them in a way that made sense and that worked. Um, 
So to me, that sounds perfect. That was, uh, in fact, similar to what I was going to propose, though the added, the, the piece of that that's added to what I was going to propose is making the court the custodian of the records once the case moves to the court, which is even better. I just hadn't thought of that. Um, so I, I support that as a plan. Um, I think that it's important to make sure that we, that whatever happens, and it seems, you know, I, I'm not saying this as criticism of the proposal. I'm saying this just sort of by way of further explaining my support for that proposal is that, you know, the really what's important is that um, until such a time as someone has decided, uh, you know, typically a judge has decided that a case belongs in the criminal docket with the full publicity that's attendant to that status, that as long as the a case is still presumptively a juvenile case, um, that we be keeping those records, both of arrests and of court confidential. Um, and there's actually a lot of good research about how the confidentiality of juvenile court records is particularly important compared to adult court records, which are obviously presumptively public. Um, and it's been tied a lot, you know, one of my favorite actually, one of my favorite studies of this came out of, I believe, Ohio. And it was, um, it was a matched pairs study between kids in one Ohio county that were being prosecuted as adults in criminal court publicly with you know, arrest records and newspaper articles and everything else. And uh, compared to another county in Ohio where everyone was being treated totally confidentially uh, because in Ohio, they're a much more county-based system so they can even have those kinds of distinctions county to county. And one of, it's, it's one of the few longitudinal studies of uh, delinquency prosecutions and the different ways in which delinquency prosecutions affect kids in the long term. And one of the records that I thought were, or one of the uh, points of data that, I, that they looked at that I thought was kind of a brilliant way to look at this is they looked at um, five and 10 years down the road, how many of these kids were filing tax returns because that was public information and it was information that they could get their hands on. And it's sort of an indicator if you're filing a tax return that you are at least to some degree um, a pretty functional member of society. And they actually found real, you know, huge disparity between the kids who were treated confidentially in the juvenile court and the kids who were treated publicly in the criminal court in terms of how many of them went on five and 10 years down the line to be taxpaying members of the community. Um, and so I, you know, my, my only point by bringing that up is to say that I think that some people look at this issue of confidentiality and you know media reports of, that identify children um, as being sort of uh, not that important, not that critical. Uh, but when you look at what it really means to not just sort of the the process for these kids, but to their eventual outcomes, you know, looking down the line, it's really really important. It is. It, you know, that's a factor that will make a difference for a number of kids in terms of whether they're able to really get past that adolescent, um, you know, maladaptive behavior that causes kids to engage in juvenile offenses, or whether they go on to, you know, really develop that maladaptive behavior into what we would consider to be, you know, adult criminogenic risk and adult criminality. So I say that again, not to suggest that anything needs to change from the proposal uh, that Senator White just outlined, but really more to explain my support for it. Thank you, and we're sorry we didn't let you propose it because we would have loved that, but- um, Oh, no, you no. did You came up with a better proposal than I had, so. No, well, it was Tucker, it was Tucker. Well, so, he came up with a better proposal than I had. Can I just suggest that we also make it clear that there can, I was just thinking about this, that there can be, be no adjectives in front of the word juvenile. It can't say a female juvenile or a black juvenile or a Hispanic juvenile. It has to be juvenile. 
And I don't know how, I don't know that we can say that in the legislation exactly, Tucker, but I think that we need to make that clear. And I agree with that. And I'm not sure how to legislate that, but I, yeah. you know, especially in some of our smaller counties, there's certain adjectives that just the adjective alone is really identifying. Yeah. yeah. Um, particularly if you strung a couple of them together, you know, yeah. if it was, you know, a, a black child from the town that I'm, you know, that I lived in up until last year, Waterville, Vermont, which has only got 600 people in it, that would identify the person right there. Um, and so I think that's important to just to, and that's, you know, in all of the work that we do, uh, we have to dis, you know, we have to be more careful about how we present disaggregated data in Vermont than they do in other states, because we see that pretty commonly yeah. where there's, you know, such a, such a small population that any, you know, even if we're not identifying a child by name, any status or indicator can actually be very much identifying. Anybody else? So if we were <coughs> to get this um, written up, Tucker, do you think that you can, I promised Mike Donahue that we would not do this on a Tuesday again because the Tuesday is when all the weeklies are under their time constraint for publication. So next Thursday, maybe. Okay, and and I would say that let's um, send this out to the media, the state's attorneys, um, the sheriff's association. Um, um, who else shall we send it to to um, get input, and then we'll take testimony on it and try and maybe wrap it up. ACLU. Yes, uh, Senator Calm. I couldn't. Brian and Anthony, you're so close together. And Anthony, you're sitting on this side of your screen, and Brian's on this side of the screen. So when your hand comes up, I'm not sure which one it is. I think that was Senator Collimore. Thank you. We spend all day together, Madam Chair. That's why uh, Senator oh. Selena and I are so close. <laughs> okay. um, I guess I'm always trying to capture all of the law enforcement folks. And I never know whether that means the police chiefs association, the sheriff's association, you know, uh, the troopers. I mean, there's so many yep. associations. But I think well, they all should be contacted. Yeah, I think the the um, the the state's attorneys definitely should. The sheriff's association, police chiefs, the police association, because that's um, members. That's not the chiefs. And then DPS, uh, VSP. Um, um, I guess that's uh, that's kind of it for the law enforcement agencies, and then we have. Um, I I would I would uh, think we should contact um, the media and maybe ACLU and um, yeah. we'll we'll get a list together and make sure, uh, Commissioner. If you send it to me and probably to Pepper we can get it to all the law enforcement agencies. Wonderful, thank you. Good. Okay, great. Uh, Senator, Senator Clarkson, oops. No, I... Senator, Senator Polino was next. No, okay. no I'm, I'm good. I was gonna mention the ACLU and the media as well. Oh. I'm, I'm fine, thanks. Thanks. Senator Clarkson. Thanks. I, yeah, I think key is, uh, I think you've covered it all, but I had an additional thought and it just has evaporated. So there we are. What can I say? Um, I just think it's important for local, you know, local police who, who, you know, particularly from small communities, it would be great to have one person who represents that crowd weigh in. I think that the police chiefs association and the police association are probably the people who would represent them. No, and I appreciate Marshall your your study, the longitudinal study. I wish we could afford to do more longitudinal studies in this state. Every time we enact something that would you that, that would have you know really profound data like that, because it, we know intuitively that that juvenile arrests have huge impact on people's lives, and 
whether you keep it confidential or not. We know the outcomes are just varied by a bunch of different factors, but that's great to have that study. And if you uh, ever felt like sending that link to that study to Gail, we'd appreciate it. I can certainly do that. Um, and I'll say, you know, it's not just Vermont. Those longitudinal studies are very difficult, complex, and expensive. And so honestly, that study, that Ohio study, which was called, um, gosh, I'm blanking on the name of it, um, but it was, a, it was essentially a simplified by saying a study. It's one giant data set from which many studies have come. Um, and it really is the gold standard in juvenile justice because it's pretty much the only large longitudinal study that compares similarly situated juveniles who went through a juvenile court to, uh, you know, to the same population of juveniles going through an adult court. And as far as I'm aware, it's the only study like it in the country. Um, and it's used extensively. Uh, Pathways to desistance was what the data set was called. And then there's been a bunch of studies that have used that data set. Um, took me a minute to remember the name. Sorry, what, what was it called? Pathways to? Desistance. Um, sort of the opposite of recidivism is desistance. Uh, you desist from criminal behavior. Oh, that, yeah, it's a, a, not used often. No. <laughs> So um, Marshall does, um, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Rahm. I do wanna stay on that line of questioning. No, 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 no. go ahead, please. Um, I just couldn't recall if we've heard from the DMV and I feel like they're coming up a lot as a entity that can like, have discretion. In some okay. cases, the records they release, I just wanted to flag that. Yeah, actually, that's a great idea. We need to, we need to hear from them. And I just, Marshall does um, uh, legal aid ever represent uh, youth? Because I know that they, one of the issues they have is how uh, criminal records affect so many of their, their clients. Yeah. You know, my That's experience my is that legal aid is not representing youth in criminal court or in delinquency court but they certainly, we've worked very closely with legal aid. They represent youth in uh, school related stuff. So actually okay. that's, I primarily, my, my interface with legal aid is when I have kids who are charged with stuff that's gonna also result in school discipline or expulsion or suspension. And they'll represent the, the kid on the school side and I'll represent them in the, on the court side. Um, but they very well might have some input into this. Um, and in particular, you know, I would say, well, I'll leave it to legal aid to pick out who's, you know. <coughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll notify them and see. And we'll um, get, I'm not sure who um, at DMV, if it would be Wanda or Mike Smith, maybe, but we'll, we'll definitely notify them. Pepper? I would, I would go with Mike Smith. We, we've been speaking yeah. with him in our juvenile justice stakeholder meeting about a related issue. Okay. Uh, Senator Clarkson. So the other two, you know, just as we're thinking broadly about this, Ohio has me thinking broadly, um, which is unusual. Uh, diversion, it, it strikes me that diversion should also probably weigh in on this because they do a lot of, of you know, re redirecting people's lives in many ways at its best. Um, and, well, we could and, hear from diversion, but I'm not sure that if, if the, once, and, and once it goes okay. to diversion, it's confidential. And so if we're keeping it confidential before that. Right, but they may have some experience with, anyway, I, it just struck me that diversion would be an additional voice in this, but maybe, maybe not. I, Strikes strikes me that they we, are we rolling could, in this sea. We could ask them if they want to um, get involved. I don't want us to go too far into the the um, programs that are offered and how they're offered, but to keep it relatively narrow. That that's my my thought here. I don't know. Um, so that we're talking about initial arrest records. 
but yeah, but D DMB definitely has to be here. So right. Okay. Anything else, committee? I think that's a good. Tucker? Thank you, thank you, Tucker. Uh, before you move too far along, I just want to make sure that I have the important policy decisions down as we start moving forward on this. And the first that I wanna peg down is whether you intend to have an exemption for all records related to the arrest or because it was part of a lot of your discussion, whether this is going to apply to specific information within those records. And there's an important distinction in the Public Records Act between those two. Um. I, what do you think, committee? I, 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 I think that there definitely will be um, pressure to say there was an accident with an unidentified juvenile or with a, yeah, with a juvenile. With a juvenile. But um, uh, that's about it. I don't know that we can keep the entire record exempt, but what do you think, committee? I keep Senator Colomar. I, I really didn't understand the distinction that Tucker was trying to make. Okay. If an exemption <laughs> applies to the record in its entirety, then no information from the record is released whatsoever. It's referred to as a categorical exemption. So if a request comes in for the record and it says specifically in the exemption that these records are exempt, it's withheld. If it says in yeah. Yeah. So your 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 thought is that it would be that the record isn't exempt, but any um, identifying information or potentially damaging information um, that um, potential for damaging information in a subsequent trial that those things be kept so that you wouldn't say that a juvenile had a BAC of 0.12. You would just say um, accident, arrest, whatever the, the, whatever it was for and a juvenile involved. Is that, is that where you would go, Senator Colmar? I, I guess I, I was under the impression that the uh, alcohol content of the blood was already not part of the arrest record. So I don't know that we need to get involved at that level. I was okay. thinking just not I, of having no identifying characteristics of the, of the juvenile that was charged. Period. Okay. Senator Polina? I agree with Senator Colmar. Thank you. Senator Clarkson? Uh, I, I would agree, sort of. I was actually leaning into keeping it all uh, confidential, but actually I think the, those basic facts would be okay. But Senator we have, Rahm? We have, we have time to think about it. Senator Rahm? Yeah, I would agree. And I was just thinking you can't keep like the make of the car confidential. You know, there's a lot of things that it would be just too challenging, so. Well, the make of the car is very identifying. Right. Well, but I, how would we tell them not to do that? You well, know? you say uh, on uh, any uh, information that could identify the youth. Right. Oh, yeah, so you, we can they cover couldn't it. identify the car. They could just say a car, it, 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 an accident which involved a car and a tractor, or okay, I thought a car and a snowmobile, or a car and a whatever. So let's um, give that information to Tucker that we don't want any identifying information, but we don't want a categorical, categorical exemption. Yeah, I don't think so. I will put a few options together for the committee. And as we go over them, I'll highlight some issues that come up when you exempt information instead of records, because okay. uh, then what happens is the tests that are applied by the public agencies will ultimately determine the scope of what is withheld. So we'll put a pin in that because okay. depending on the request right. and the event in the context, more information could be withheld or less. Um, the last piece is uh, 
we brought it up earlier, the clause that is sometimes appended here and shall keep confidential. Do you want to impose that duty on these public agencies to keep the information confidential? Or yes. is this exemption going to be subject to a balancing test between the public's interest in the information and the individual's um, interest in privacy? Confidential, all of it, I think. I, I would start with shall be confidential and we yeah. can um, change it from there, but Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tucker, can I ask you who would be in charge of deciding whether it rose to that level? Would it be the same public agency? Talking about this specific, oh, you're talking about the balancing test. It would be yep. the records officer for that agency. The records officer would be the one making the decision in that balancing test. Um, and if you want, I can send you some cases where the Supreme Court has looked at the duty to balance those interests and when specifically there's an overriding public interest um, that outweighs individuals interest in privacy. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Senator Clarkson. So, so Tucker, are you finished with your questions for us? Because I have a question for you. Are you done with what you need? Okay. Yes, Senator you, Clarkson. <laughs> no, you just, uh, I, and I just, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know the answer to this. You said in Vermont, after you said we we're one of the most protective of, it, of juveniles in the country, one of the seven most protective, um, you also said we had two custodians of public records. And I just was thinking, my God, we have masses of custodians of public records. How can we, you say we only have two? And I, so I'm curious what the two are because I think of well, lots of different places that could be custodians. So who are So when we were discussing two? that, I, I said two in the specific situation that we were looking oh, okay. at. You're right. You do have many, many, many custodians of public records. And the issue right. that I was pointing to was actually that the Public Records Act procedures are put on the custodian of records, but our Public Records Act doesn't define who the custodian is. It doesn't define the term custodian. So you have simultaneous custodians for records. In that instance, there are two. In other instances, there are maybe dozens that are all right. custodians of the same set of records. Right, that, that's what puzzled me so. And so your proposal has two custodians of record in these cases. Is, is that? Until the point that the um, case is referred to court, in which case there is one, which would be the court. Okay. And <clears throat> Tucker, are you the custodian of our public records? I am not. Oh, I am is? not. Uh, you are all individual custodians, oh, likely. I'll right. put likely as a tag on there. I am the records officer for the Office of Legislative Counsel okay, and right. occasionally provide legal advice to Thank other you. agencies. That is right. That is right. But and we those are of us, our own custodians. Those of us who've had FOIA uh, requests have appreciated your wise counsel. Yes, we have. So um, <clears throat> any more questions or comments here on this? And um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. All right. And um, we'll hope to hear from next Thursday. We'll hope to hear from the um, Marshall and Pepper and uh, Chris Herrick again and, and other people on this. We'll make sure that we have a robust um, discussion so that everybody gets heard. And then, um, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, committee, is there anything else that we need to address? Did anybody have any elections issues that they didn't get on the list yet? Because I'm going to finalize it tonight. That, that is some list that you created. <laughs> Unbelievable. I've, I've got more now. Some of them, I have to say, a couple of the ones that came from the Secretary of State's office, I didn't even understand what they meant. 
So I'll put them on there and we'll see. And they can, exp they can explain. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I have to say I'm, I'm proud I, I only gave you one. That's because so many other one, other people had multiple ones and your list was already so long. I only added one. I, I feel so proud of myself. I'm, I am happy though that um, we decided not to attribute the suggestions to anybody. Yes. That was my first thought. And now I'm, I'm very happy that you convinced me not to do that. That was a good idea. <laughs> Senator Colomore. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your getting back to me with respect to the mail I got from Herb Ogden, who has asked uh, a lot of questions about the uh, new statute regarding the moving of potential moving of town meeting day and the mail out ballots. I don't know whether I even have time to read all the questions, let alone answer all of them. Um, I don't know what to do. You know, I. I um I will respond to him. Okay. Um, I a thank lot you. Of, a lot of his questions were. Um, I I think that I'm not sure if he just didn't understand that school districts are a municipality. So if you have five towns, five towns in a school district, that is a municipality, and it's separate from the five towns. So he, he spent, there were a number of questions about, so what if town X decides not to send out their ballot and the school district decides to send out their ballot? How, do, how come town X doesn't have to? Because they're separate municipalities. And I just, I, <clears throat> um, so, the school district acts on its own. It may or may not have any, we've, over the years, what we've done, I think, is we've conflated town meeting with school meetings. And as a result, people are really confused that, because when, when we, um, when Act 46 went into um, being, whether you agreed with it or not, what a bunch of our towns were saying is we're killing town meeting. And I said, no, we might be ki killing school meeting in the individual town, but we're not killing town meeting. They're different. And if the only reason people go to town meeting is for the school meeting, then we really need to look at what we what towns are all about. So I, I think he he spent there were out of he had, I think, um, about 25 questions on there. And I think that a number of them were related to that, to mixing up towns and schools. So did other members of the committee get that same email? Uh, oh, well, her, Herb, I looped Jeanette in. We, you and I had been working on that with Jeanette when he first emailed. And I thought, I think I saw his uh, additional emails. No, he, he, he just sent. Uh, was it was just to you and Brian? Well, he sent it to Brian. Brian sent it to me. He, um, he it was, in it was I the first a list one. of questions and answers that he had had with the town with the secretary of state so he had his question and yeah. then the secretary of state's answer his question and the secretary of state's answer so i i'm not sure that there's anything to do with it ex because the secretary of state answered all the questions um I think the one thing that is not on the elections list that I um, am putting on there is the um, having the conversation about <clears throat> um, school elections and town, because uh, they don't follow the same um, guidelines. But, and, but Jeanette, it's natural that people don't think about it because for many of us who are in supervisory unions, or, you know, we have been voting Australian ballot for the school budget, for the high school budget for years, and it's on the same ballot as all the town stuff. So it is, it, you know, that people don't necessarily separate them. Right, That's, right. But so it, it's not, um, it, it's never presented as a separate thing. So 
you know, it was when the elementary school was just Woodstock and they did the school part of town meeting. And then, but now of course they don't because we're now all even more one district. But so I, it's easy for people to think, not think about schools being separate municipalities because they isn't a separate vote. Those votes are taken on town meeting with the rest of everything else we vote on. Well, sometimes ours, our union district, our supervisory union was not on the same ballot. Mm -hmm. our, our supervisory union met at a different time and passed a budget and then um, they assessed the towns. And so, I only brought it up to, to not necessarily, I didn't mean to cast any aspersions on, on Mr. Ogden. I mean, no. clear that he could ask those questions. It was sent to the three Rutland County senators and mm -hmm. Linda Joy Sullivan, who's his house rep. But I just wanted to mention my appreciation to the chair for taking it up. Um, right. Well, he, he, he emailed us a while ago with the yeah. first. This was, this was a separate email. Yeah, and this was, I, I didn't get them. Right. Keisha, did you have a? Yeah, um, sorry I didn't bring in this up earlier. Um, this is a separate topic. Tomorrow, when we talk about the DPS modernization plan, um, I, I know at one point you had said, you know, you want to make sure people can testify who are impacted by these kinds of decisions from uh, communities of color. Um, I, it doesn't have to be tomorrow. I just didn't know if we're putting it on the docket in the future again and inviting a wider circle of people to testify. But I know Mark Hughes would like to say something. And um, I was going to ask if possible, Ashley Laporte has been um, a major racial justice activist and put in a letter um, opposing the plan to when the docket was open. So I was going to see if there are a couple other people in the circle that I let know about the hearings that also wanted to be heard on the issue. My guess is that they won't be heard tomorrow mm -hmm. because Tomorrow, what we need to do is walk through so that we understand what it is. But I would suggest that they listen. Okay. So, because then they will have a sense of what's presented to us and the questions that we ask and stuff. And so they'll have more clarity on, on what it is that's being actually presented. So, well, and then yeah. we definitely will be taking it up because we have um, <clears throat> a, an executive order um, I, I don't quite understand the, um, uh, the way they work is that if one chamber objects to it by April 15th, then it, uh, if nobody, if neither chamber object by April 15th, then it just goes into effect. If one chamber uh, objects, then, and, and my thought is that, um, we we would not be either objecting or um, accepting it exactly the way it is, but that we would be taking testimony and working on it. <clears throat> but the way I understand it is for some reason, the governor's office said that in this case, both chambers had to object or it would go into effect. And I think that is not the way executive orders work. So will <clears throat> Senator Con Brian, you are spot on, Madam Chair. In the first year of a biennium, the governor is uh, able to introduce executive orders, which if one of the chambers does not approve, it fails. If both do, it becomes, well, it has the f uh, effect and, and force of law. And we have 90 days from the time it was sent to us to act on it. So you are correct. I believe that's April 15th. <clears throat> so we, my, and my, my um, position is not to just say either yes or no, but to look at the details of it and see if any of it makes sense or if not. And just for your information, I will say that I have had, I have introduced um, a similar bill at least twice. So we have discussed this in this committee at length, the, the, elevate, the elevating <clears throat> to an agency and, and a way to bring in all these little higgledy piggledy, all this vast patchwork of law enforcement well, under one umbrella. I don't, I don't think that there's any intention of bringing in law, all law enforcement. 
under the the a local or sheriffs. I don't think that I may be wrong, but I don't think that that is oh, in the executive I, order. I, I thought this was all. <clears throat> Um, well, we'll I, find out. Yeah, we will. And um, I, I think that, yeah, it, it's a, it's a, a huge issue. And one of the, one of the problems, I'm just going to throw this out with the Department of Public Safety is that <clears throat> it, you probably know that the statutes never, never mention um, the state police. There's nothing in the statutes about state police. There's just the Department of Public Safety and the state police grew out of that. So there's this association that in fact, the Department of Public Safety is the state police and that that's what they are. And I think that one of the, one of the attempts to make it an agency is to, to emphasize more the um, other functions of it like emergency management and fire and safety and and the academy. So I, I think that that's, but I'm going up to the state house tomorrow morning and I am um, grabbing my files on law enforcement that are about 13 inches thick at this point. So if anybody wants me to grab theirs, I'll have them sent to you. Sure. Someone's going to mail me one or something. You can find it. Well, you don't have any files yet. Okay, but are they still, do, they're going to mail a, not a file, but like the book, someone mailing the book? No, that's title, title 17. Okay. No one's. If there's no. If you find it in my desk, Madam Chair, that would be great. I will, <clears throat> if you want me to, I will go into your drawers and your desk and see what I can find on law enforcement and have Mike send it to you. There might even be some Twizzlers. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> no, they're red. <laughs> That's true. Oh, ma Madam Chair, I, yeah. I did bring back my law enforcement records. I was so proud of myself. But I did not, I cannot find my ch Title 17, which I may be on the top of our, uh, of our filing cabinets, right by okay. our desks. Right I'm going to look chairs. for, I'm going to look for all of them. Anthony, Mine has my name in it. Too. Anthony, you found yours, didn't you? Yes, I took it home with me. I took it that home with me. That was so clever of you. Why? Well, I and hate to be caught without it. <laughs> Brian, Brian um, uh, John Bloomer volunteered to take yours home, but if I'm going to send you law enforcement files, I'll stick it in there with that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I hate to be without my Masons. Oh, yes. A oh. disaster. <gasps> Oh, it is a disaster. So I'm I'm grabbing it. Becca has been using it up to this point, but Bloomer is going to get her another one, and I'm going to get that one. I, I I have a copy. If Becca wants to borrow mine, mine's in my desk. Oh, it is. Okay, I'll tell her. Yeah, he was because gonna... I bought one when I it was in the house. They're expensive. Okay. I know. Um, I but I love mine. Yes. Oh, they're John very Bloomer. Useful. John Bloomer once said, when we're sitting in the uh, chamber, he said, I always hate it when Senator White takes out her masons because <laughs> he's, she's gonna ask me a question or do something. So anyway, so anything else committee here that, um, so I will get the elections list done up tonight. I'll get uh, put everything in there that I can think of and I'm sure other things will come up and, um, <clears throat> I got some more today from senators. So, well, then, you did good outreach. And then we'll um, start looking at it. And I think that <clears throat> we're going to do elections um, on Thursday of this week, I believe. And what I'd like to do then on Friday or Thursday is just have a little discussion about how we should organize that list in terms of taking testimony from people <clears throat> and some people are gonna wanna comment on every one of them. And I, we might wanna look at things that on the list that are, for example, there was um, one recommendation, I don't know if it got on there or not yet, was to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote yeah. in state elections. That's a constitutional issue. Right. We can't, we can't do that. So we might as well just cross that one off. I wouldn't add it. 
Well, I'm no, I, I'm putting everything on the oh, list. Oh, you're putting everything on it, right. Okay. I'm not going to make any judgments about <clears throat> it, but right. I think that we could go through and look at things that we really either don't have time to take up or are beyond, the, like that's beyond us. We can't do it anyway. So, and, and well, cross those things off. 